Um, so thanks again for letting me talk. And Steve apologizes and sends his regrets for not being uh, here, but I'm glad that I'm able to talk in his place because I think this is an important issue. Um, so again, I'm from the National Center for Science Education. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, just a little bit of background about what we do and where we're from. So we started about 30 years ago uh, in the early 80s. And uh, it was a direct response to attempts by school boards to bring creationism into science classrooms. And so it was a central clearinghouse for scientists, science lovers, um, science well-wishers to be able to work together on a grassroots level and ensure that good quality science education was happening in public schools. So a lot of the things that I'm talking about today have their roots in the defense of evolution education, but the parallels between evolution denial and climate change denial are just very evident and you'll see as I talk more about it. So over the 30 years of working on um, science denial, at NCSC, we've, we've discovered three sort of pillars that hold up science denial. The first is undermining the science. Uh, the next is claiming the results are evil. And the third is demand equal time. So uh, for, for different ideas and alternative concepts. And so for evolution, you're probably familiar with what this looks like. For climate change, it's similar, but there are some differences. Um, so when you're undermining the science, you say the science is wrong, we don't have enough information, or there are accusations of scientific conspiracies and um, it's being pushed by ideologues and so on. When you cl claim the results are evil, instead of um, with evolution where you're just going to burn in hell, um, for <laughs> uh, climate change it has more economic implications and concerns about big government conspiracies. So there's a big divergence in terms of how the groups perceive um, the sort of claims are evil of these two scientific issues. And the last is demanding equal time. So why can't we uh, let the students decide? We'll show them everything. Um, and this comes in the terms of critical thinking and uh, to teach them both science and to teach strengths and weaknesses of concepts. And this is really when the legislation and policy comes into play is this focus on, in America, we're very focused on being fair and giving everyone an equal say. And that's where academic freedom acts come in. Has anyone heard about these at all? A little bit? Good, some people. Um, they first appeared in Alabama in 2004, and they used this term critical thinking to allow teachers to bring in alternative ideas to non, uh, alternative non-scientific ideas regarding evolution and chemical origins of life. And so this was a sort of backdoor way of bringing in creationism and intelligence desi intelligent design into the science classroom. And this first attempt in 2004 failed. But why am I talking about it here? This is a climate change um, conference, not an evolution one. Well, there were many more attempts to bring academic freedom acts into, uh, science, into states to allow alternative ideas to scientific concepts into scientific classrooms until, and they all failed until we got to Louisiana in 2008. Louisiana was different. Um, Louisiana Bill, instead of just focusing on evolution and chemical origins of life, they included global warming. So our bill has evolved. Um, as an interesting little side note, next to global warming, you'll see human cloning was also added in. And I don't know where they're teaching human cloning, like how to clone a person in a biology high school classroom, but I want to be there because that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, this bill passed in 2008. And since then, with that success, they moved on. And you can see many different states have attempted multiple times to introduce similar bills often, again, focusing on evolution and chemical origins of life, often also human cloning, and then occasionally global warming or climate change. Until we get to Tennessee, which was passed in 2012. And Tennessee's bill was similar to Louisiana one, so it also included global warming. Um, and it was, very, it was very sneaky the way it came in. So it was introduced, you'll see on the left, it was introduced in February of 2011. And it got um, sort of put, pushed to the side. So it was just like kind of sitting there waiting. No one was going to vote on it. And then when everyone went out on spring break, they pushed it through really, really quickly. And so there weren't any teachers around. There weren't any students around. Um, 
in order to try to uh, push back against the legislation. And this is typically how these sorts of things go through. It happens very, very, very quickly. Okay, and since that time, there's been multiple other attempts. Again, all of them has failed, and each and every time, my organization and CSC has done grassroots rallying of folks in each of the communities to make sure that people are showing up to school committee meetings if necessary, or legislative sessions to be testifying, to be bothering um, whoever needs to be bothered to make sure this legislation doesn't pass. So when you see it says dead, 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 it's not because it didn't pass because nobody cared, it's because actually there was um, grassroots resport, uh, response from the community to make sure that they didn't pass. So this is a full-time job that we're doing. One thing to notice about this list, the very last one, Kansas, was focused for the first time on climate science alone. And so this is the first time we've seen climate science targeted specifically. And for those of you who study climate, other areas of climate science that aren't really controversial, you might be shocked to find out that you would be grouped in with this as well as, t as, learn as researching something very controversial. This one didn't pass. So what's the problem with teaching lots of ideas, uh, whether or not they're scienti scientific or, or they um, in a science classroom? Uh, what's the problem with that? Can we let the students figure it out for themselves? So having worked with lots of teachers and chatting with them at conferences and doing uh, professional development and stuff, this is what we're finding happens when you teach multiple ideas regarding climate change, is you, you teach one side, which should typically is something like an inconvenient truth that demonstrates the science and the implications of climate change. And then you teach another side, which is um, tends to be one of these, these uh, lesson plans or videos um, that uh, deny that climate change is happening. So what do these lesson plans look like? Well, they follow the typical um, patterns that, we've been, that I've been mentioning. So they undermine the science, they claim the results are evil, and they demand for equal time. So they say the science is wrong, we don't have enough information. Um, they make accusations of scientific conspiracies and ideologues, which is kind of a creepy thing to think about happening in your science classroom, being given this material. Um, they claim the results are evil, so there tends to be a big push regarding um, uh, the economic implications, and uh, they t also can make uh, implications or accusations of big government conspiracies. And worst of all, they're riddled with really bad science. And this is the thing that actually gets me really worked up because I remember when I was in high school thinking, this is a waste of my, of my time. And then uh, thinking of poor kids in science classroom being given this stuff and them knowing that this is a total waste of their time. Um, and so uh, it uses uh, poor citations. It, it cites materials coming out of the same sort of think tanks that are um, creating the materials rather than citing original sources. Um, or it'll cite um, scientific documents, but ones that date back um, to 1999 or something like that. So um, not timely, not, not really relevant anymore. So the question is, what can I do about it? So the challenges that we have is that these come up each legislation, legislative session, and um, they, the only way to sort of work to make sure they don't get enacted is to follow the legislation, or you can follow us at NCSC because we have a whole team that follows it, um, contact legislators and show up to the meetings um, to actually make sure that this doesn't happen. And I think the largest challenge that we have at NCSE is I showed you those big list of, of uh, bills that never made it through. And so people think, well, these will never pass because they never make it through. But two already have, and there's always a, a consistent risk um, that once they get moving through the different sessions, they'll go through really quickly. So you really have to be on, on, on top of it as much as possible. And that's it. Thank you.